picture a world where wrongdoing only brings wealth way more lucratively than the honest job. Ever wonder if that's true what they always told you, crime doesn't pay? Well, welcome to California and welcome to Leslie Van Houten. Dear Board of Prison Terms, my name is Barbara Hoyt. I testified in many Manson-related trials against these defendants for seven years. I also testified before you on 10-20-06 against Bruce Davis. I lived with the Manson family for six months when I was 17 years old. One of the ways I have to judge whether or not a particular defendant has changed or is sorry is by how truthful they are in the present about their roles in the past. If they're lying or minimizing their actions, I know it because I was there. I was struck by Leslie's 2006 parole hearing because she made the task more difficult by refusing like Sadie. Sadie, referring to Susan Atkins. That's Susan Atkins' nickname, in case you didn't know. Because she made that task more difficult by refusing to discuss the crime events at all. She not only murdered these poor people, but she is now playing Manson-esque games, i.e. demanding that their memories cease to exist. This is a major red flag to me. In none of Leslie's prior parole hearings that I have watched has she ever owned up how aggressive she was or how aggressive her participation was in these crimes. If there was something she wanted and you got in her way, she could be quite abusive. Her demeanor never changed after the murders. Her effect was never sad to me. According to Sadie, whoever heard talking about the murders to Oish, Oish, Leslie first Miss LaBianca into her bedroom, put a pillowcase over her head, and wrapped a lamp cord around her neck, and shoved her onto the bed and held her down so Katie, Patricia Krenwangle, could stab her, which she attempted, but her knife bent on the victim's collarbone. When Mrs. LaBianca overheard her husband being murdered, she jumped from the bed with superhuman strength, screaming, what are you doing to my husband? She managed to keep Leslie and Katie at bay by swinging the lamp at them with the cord still wrapped around her neck. So Leslie got Tex, she knocked the lamp from Mrs. LaBianca's hands, and Tex, with a large knife, stabbed her, bringing her to the people that live with the Manson family, who despite believing that Charlie Manson was Jesus Christ, that despite fearing the coming of the end of the world and held her scouter, despite the cult techniques of indoctrination, choose not to harm others, even if it meant not surviving held her scouter. There was also a group of the family members who couldn't wait to kill Leslie, was in the latter group. I believe that even without Charlie, she would have harmed others in some capacity. I saw an interview with Leslie's father and he stated that he's never asked her about the murders and she's never commented about it. He's not lost any sleep over this entire, over this crime. And he doesn't think about the victims and he forgave Charlie Manson a long time ago. It must be nice. If my child had been involved in a murder, I would have asked a lot of questions and I would have lost a lot of sleep. Leslie's ability to kill, or excuse me, Leslie's ability to feel no concern for others isn't a trait she learned from Charlie, but from her father. Charlie just gave her a place to express herself. She chose to kill. She asked to kill. She wasn't a mindless, drug-crazed, zombie soldier for Charlie, as she described herself in an earlier parole hearing. She had lots of fun. She played games, camp, sang songs, raced dune buggies, had casual sex with favorite partners. She enjoyed herself. She was not an innocent who was plucked from her home. She came to the family with her own group, including Bobby Beausoleil and Gypsy Cher, who were both involved in another murder and attempted murder. Leslie also at the time knew that what she did was wrong. On the morning following the LaBianca murders, I entered the back house of the ranch to find Leslie on the bed counting coins. A call came from the field phone that a man was on his way to the back house looking for Leslie. She told me the man had given her a ride last night from Griffith Park and for me to hide her, which I did. In 1977, Leslie was out of prison for a few months. She came to Paul Watkins' home and I met her there. She demanded of me, did I know what it was like to live under a death sentence? Having been a victim of an attempted murder, I said, indeed, I did know. And I wasn't given a trial like she had. I feel from her statements that the only person that she feels is a victim here is herself. 
I compare the Manson story to that of Hitler because there are so many similarities. Both groups consisted of antisocial people who in their blood thirst quest for personal power were willing to kill innocent people to get it. At least Hitler's cronies were held responsible for their murders despite pleas that they were only following orders. And so should the Manson followers who chose to kill. Both groups have left behind a legacy of evil that haunts us still today. I believe that if Leslie were truly and deeply sorry, she would stop these pearl herrings and let the victims' families have some peace and serve her time in silence and dignity. In closing, I would like to say to Leslie that there is a fact that you seem to be unaware of, and that is that murder is something you can never recover from or make right, the victims never get their lives back, the families never get to stop mourning, the witnesses never again get to live without fear, and the killers spend the rest of their lives in prison. You demanding to be able to leave prison would mean that you would be the only one to be able to walk away from the carnage you caused, and that would be a travesty of justice. Thank you. Barbara Hoyt. Oh, rest in peace, Barbara Hoyt. Those were her last words to the court. She left them behind before she died. Leslie Van Houten, a name steeped in notoriety and injustice, cunningly navigated a path to financial success. As Forbes reported, her staggering net worth at $15 million. Yet don't be deceived, she isn't rolling in piles of cash. The true scandal lies in how she had amassed this wealth. Capitalizing on interviews and book deals and magazines and all these things while she was behind bars. In a bitter twist of irony, while the media criticized Charles Manson for allegedly profiting from his crimes, it was Leslie who played the system. In a 1994 Larry King interview, she not only deflected responsibility for her heinous actions, but also profited handsomely from it. The same media that pointed fingers at Manson turned a blind eye to Leslie's cunning game. Throughout the years, she adeptly played both sides, claiming ignorance about the Manson while pinning the blame on him. The California criminal system, often criticized for its flaws, ironically became a stage where Leslie orchestrated her financial ascent. In a world where justice is meant to prevail, Leslie Van Houten emerges richer than most Californians. She achieved this not through redemption or remorse, but by profiting off the blood-stained legacy she refuses to fully own. Meanwhile, consider the victims like Lino LaBianca, a diligent entrepreneur who built a prosperous grocery store empire, or Sharon Tate, a rising Hollywood star who crafted her wealth through hard work and talent. Their promising futures and hard-earned wealth were brutally snatched away by the Manson family. Leslie, the proprietor, thrived while the victims' legacies faded in obscurity. It's an unsettling reflection of the unfairness of life. As we grapple with this injustice portrayed in this tale, the question lingers. Is it truly worth following the rules in life? The answer in the face of such glaring injustice remains a moral yes. For even in the face of adversity, following the path of honesty and integrity prefers the essence of humanity, offering a chance for redemption, true prosperity beyond the tainted gains of crime. The Hollywood actress Sharon Tate, when she was murdered in 1969, her net worth was $1.5 million. By today's money, that's about 10 million bucks. Uh, Lino LaBianca, the grocery store owner, when he was murdered in 1969 by the Manson family, he was worth two million bucks. By today's standard, that's probably about 14 million bucks. Leslie Van Houten, she's the one that went in and killed at the La Bianca house, took all them dreams away, took that two million dollars away from that whole, yeah, she's worth 15 million bucks. So if, the, if you ever hear that again, crime doesn't pay, call BS on that, because it actually does especially here in California. Until next time, stay safe and peace.